obligatory disclaimer. Yes, there are spoilers in this video, obviously. Yes, the game is five years old, and thus a spoiler warning probably isn't that necessary despite me giving you one. And yes, I am aware that people will get mad regardless. If this is what you choose to get angry about in the midst of a global pandemic, I swear to Odin the Allfather himself, I will dislocate your eye sockets and stitch your eyelids to your lower back so you can literally watch me kick your stupid goddamn ass. Thank you for your time, and enjoy. Sup guys and gals, it's Rank and Rotten Rusty, returning with the riveting richness of recycled, reused and regurgitated revelry reserved for Rusty's respected, regarded, and most recognized religionists. Rambunctiously raining rude remarks that are redacted, restricted, and quite respectfully with a rather rapturous resolve, really. Relax, Romeo, and rest easy. Realizing Rusty's ready to rapidly revitalize your rationale, rupture your reasoning, and rectally Ragnarok your reading level with the radiant range of retorts that rivals Robert Frost himself. You ready to hear some unique tips on bosses in a game that's already been out for over five years? Oh, good, good, good. I, uh, I thought as much. So we'll start with everyone's favorite priest slash sociopath, Father Gasoline. Molotovs do a ton of damage early game, and even more so when your target is staggered. Instead of going for a visceral attack, hit Gascoigne with a charged R2 from behind, and then follow up with a Molotov, and you'll do tons more damage. It takes exactly two headshots from a hunter's pistol to stagger the cleric beast. Sometimes you'll get lucky with one if you're really close, but if you do shoot him in the head and he doesn't start reeling, it's a safe bet that he will be staggered the very next shot, so attack accordingly. Everyone knows BSB is extremely susceptible to blood cocktails, but you can actually use this item to distract her for long enough to completely bypass her final phase. Bring her down to around 40% health, leaving just barely enough HP to trigger her third phase, and then throw down a blood cocktail to keep her distracted. Her first poison AoE will go off, but she'll be locked into her current phase for the time that she's distracted, even if her health dips below 33%. This will allow you to do much more damage, and if you have a fire paper to spare, you should pretty easily kill BSB before the second AoE even goes off. Vicar Amelia is what's called a limbed boss, meaning the boss's limbs can be crippled, weakening the boss's posture. Go back and forth between hitting Amelia's left arm and her right hind leg two or three times each. Alternate between these limbs and she will almost never get a chance to attack. For the bitches of Hemwick, don't always attack the first witch you see. You do have a slight chance of running into the second witch before she even technically enters the fight. So get the first witch down to a sliver of health and then start searching for and doing damage to the second. This makes it extremely easy to finish off both witches at once and prevent the second phase from occurring entirely. Two tips for this one, because I feel like it. Dark Beast Parl has an electric charge attack that's easily spotted by him arcing his head downward and charging electricity from his underbelly. If you appropriately time a dodge into the attack, your iframes can actually outlast the radius and you won't be damaged. Definitely not wise to use this as a first resort though. This is more of a style points thing. Also, if you get bored, use your monocular to aim projectile weapons and do damage to the Dark Beast prior to triggering the start of the fight. Use the Shaman Bone Blade on the Mage Shadow. He's kind of a huge nuisance during the start of the fight, but by himself, he is the least threatening. So instead of killing him outright, hit him with the Shaman Blade and confuse him into attacking his two allies. You can obviously choose to focus on the Mage first if you prefer, but this is dependent on how good you are at giving the other two guys the slip. For me personally, the Shaman Blade works great if you want to kill one of the two aggressive swordsmen early, which trivializes the second half of the fight by quite a large margin. Rom's hitbox is still active when trying to teleport away from you. Time a charged R2 for when Rom begins to reposition herself and you should stagger her out of the animation, giving you an extra few seconds to sink in damage. For the one reborn, make sure you kill the red-coated bell bitches with either a charged R2 or another one of your attacks that you are confident can one-shot them. If your attack doesn't kill them, you run the slight but embarrassing risk of pushing them forward off the platform, where they will likely survive the fall and continue aiding the boss. Oh, just parry him, obviously. I mean, do that too, if you can, but that's that's not really a unique tip. Use the castle spires and other obstacles around the arena to block Logarius' line of sight to you when he's casting spells. Logarius will also buff himself after his first phase, which will make him much more resilient to being staggered. And just like with any Bloodborne boss, this is usually an open invitation to examine his rectal cavity with your axe. Shoot him in the face. With the cannon. Shoot him in the face with the cannon. Shoot him in the face with the cannon, and then waffle press that peanut-headed bastard with the highest AR weapon you have in your inventory. I, I don't know what else to say. You just do that and you win. 
During his final phase, the Celestial Emissary is able to grow tentacles from his head and access a new variety of long-ranged spell and laser attacks. This moveset has been widely regarded as fucking annoying, and harder than this boss deserves it to be. He's pretty weak to fire damage in this state, however, so get his health to just over a quarter, and then blaze up that axe and Beyblade his legs off. If that tip sounded shallow and unhelpful, that's because this boss is one of the biggest pushovers in Souls history, and if you die to this guy, you probably wouldn't know your R1 button from the knuckle on your own goddamn ring finger. Abritus has space lasers. <sighs> yep, just straight out the ass. Don't be intimidated by them though, because you can dodge them easily, as well as just about half of her other attacks, by getting super close to her and running around her in a circle. Other than that, yeah, just, just shoot her in the face with a cannon. Mikolash isn't anything to write home about until his second phase, where he starts getting really aggressive with arcane spells. Staying constantly within his melee range will decrease the likelihood of him casting a call beyond, and his attacks are also very easily interrupted. So if you have a lighter weapon that doesn't use too much stamina, you could reasonably consume the entire second half of his HP all in one attack chain. Murgo's Wet Nurse is a boss with a much larger health pool than most. She seems to be countered best by weapons with high burst damage like the cannon or the boom hammer. Study how she turns her blades, dodge into the attack, and then immediately start charging up an R2. Also, because of her naturally sluggish movements, this fight is one of the few where the charged R2 on the stake driver actually kinda comes in handy. Dodge into Gehrman's faster sword attacks during his first phase. Newer players tend to make the mistake of dodging backwards, which only leaves themselves open to the very next attack in the chain. It's also possible to delay this AoE by getting him to slightly less than half health, depending on how you attack him. If you get him down to around a third of his health, and then he starts charging the AoE, you could theoretically kill him completely before he even charges it. The Moon Presence can essentially be treated as a souped-up Scourge Beast fight. His most basic move is a three-hit attack combo that I'm fairly sure you actually have to try for it not to miss you, it's so goddamn bad. The Moon Presence also has an intimidating attack that immediately reduces your HP to one. I say it's intimidating because that, that's really the only thing it is. If you have a weapon with a high rally potential like the axe, you can just walk over to the boss while it's catching its breath and regain most of your health just by attacking it. Both of Bojack Horseman's back legs here are susceptible to being weakened. Approach from the side, not from behind, and attack his hind legs a couple times and he'll likely fall over and be stunned for a few seconds. Charged R2s from high DPS weapons like the boom hammer, the stake driver, or fire from the cannon staggers his leg in one shot, allowing you to get in some extra damage. The Living Failures boss fight is one of the select few occurrences where all the stars and variables align properly to actually make the lock shield not shitty. If you have enough stamina, you can block just about any single non-melee attack these guys can throw at you. Use it to face tank meteor showers and plasma balls alike, but don't try to kill any of them during the meteor shower spell because none of them will be attacking you during the animation anyways. And if you kill one of them, all that'll do will spawn another guy in its place that attacks you normally on top top of the meteor shower, so it's best to just wait this one out. I wish I had a unique tip for this fight, but I honestly don't. Maria is parry goddamn city up in this bitch. Bait out one of her combo attacks and then shoot literally any time during that combo. And just by luck alone, you'll probably catch her in the parry window. Every single one of her attacks can be parried, but that doesn't mean you should parry all of them. This crescent step attack can be parried. Probably. I've never bothered to try, because it looks too complicated to time, and it isn't like she doesn't have 19 other attacks that are much easier to catch anyways, so whatever. Most of the orphan's melee attacks start from his left side, so naturally you'll want to dodge right and into the attack to avoid getting hit. Any health regained from blood rapture runes are quadrupled, so if possible, try to heal using only parries and visceral attacks. It'll get you way more health, and you'll be saving blood vials for phase 2. The orphan is also weak to fire, so if you have a spare fire paper laying around, put it on a faster weapon like the Blades of Mercy or the Recuyo, and you might just stunlock him for a couple seconds. Once Lawrence enters his third phase and becomes a cripple, his moveset becomes annoyingly random and hard to pin down. Keep your distance from him as much as you can, and use higher damage ranged weapons like the Black Sky Eye or Simon's Bowblade to chip away at his health from afar. 
Well, I think that's just about it. I refrained from bringing up any chalice bosses because half of them are just recycled enemies from the mainline game anyways, and the other half aren't even really that hard to figure out. Obviously, if people want me to, then I will, but if no one requests it, I, I probably won't do it because that's a lot of extra footage I need to capture, and if I'm being honest, Lord knows I can't be fucked. So thanks for tuning into The Forge. I'm Rusty, and I'll see you in your nightmares. That that was creepy. That, that was really creepy. No, I can't. I can't. I can't end the video like that. Ah, shit. It's too late. Here comes the end card. No!